I work with Stefan uh, Friday night. Oh, yeah. That's great. He's joining us today. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, welcome to our weekly interview series. Uh, we're here again at the um, Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington. And this is both a, a hybrid uh, interview, although there's no one here in the auditorium right now, so hopefully people will be filtering in. Um, but I know people will be joining us online and then also watching this after the fact. But um, if you're new to our series, this is something that we do every single um, week. We have a guest artist and then we, oh, here come people now. Uh, we have a guest artist to do both an interview and then we also do a performance as well of all original uh, brand new music. And today um, we have a repeat interview with um, one of my heroes and many saxophonist heroes. He's a titan in the music industry, a titan of the saxophone, um, and his major influence on uh, the saxophone community at large and the music industry at large. Um, he's performed with the Tonight Show Band with Johnny Carson for years. He's performed with uh, Chet Baker, uh, Louis Belson, uh, Mel Lewis Orchestra, uh, Natalie Cole, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but this is the wonderful uh, Pete Chrisley, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Pete for many, many years. Pete, thank you for joining us. Well, you were in my class at Port Townsend, right? Yeah, but I, I knew you before that at Red Kelly's in Tacoma from watching oh. you play for years with Bill Ramsey's band. Red Kelly's uh, story, a little story about Red Kelly's. Red was, he liked to party. He didn't need an excuse to party, you know. And when you're a partier and you own your, your, you own your own bar, whew, uh, you know, uh, Ramsey told me, because Bill Ramsey knew him f from living here all his life, you know, and, and everything. But I met Red Kelly when he was playing with Harry James, you know, and, um, uh, but they had a plaque on the wall over the bar, and uh, uh, if you fell off a bar stool, you got your name on that plaque. Yes, uh, there, there are many stories about Reds which are, are not appropriate for uh, this interview because uh, it's, it's meant for all ages. But yes, um, for, for those that know that are around that sphere of influence of Red Kelly's in the 80s and 90s, um, those were good times, good times. And uh, you always, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and you look back and realize what a wonderful club Red Kelly's was or a place like Tula's. They come and they go and then they're gone and there's so much history that's, that's made in those venues. Hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, we were, prior to this um, conversation, uh, I was mentioning to you, normally I prepare for these interviews, but I didn't. Um, I was playing last night at a wonderful club in Portland uh, by the name of the 1905, and we got done at midnight, and I got in at like 2.30 in the morning, went to bed at 3, and got up at around 7.30, so I'm, I'm a little off oh. my game today. But we're just going to talk music, and, and for our, our viewers, uh, if you have any questions for myself or Pete, um, these interviews are meant to be interactive, so please let us know, put your questions in the comments, and we will do our best to get to them um, before the end of the interview here. Um, but we were talking before we got started here about uh, your association with Warren Marsh and those wonderful albums that you did, uh, Conversations with Warren, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And you were mentioning that what a lot of people don't know about those albums is um, you guys just went in and you, you basically improvised those on the spot, playing kind of counterpoint with one another, improvising melodies. Can you talk a little bit about that project and Warren and, and your opinions? Oh, well... The way it started, I'd I'd, uh, I'd met Warren. I I knew about Warren. I knew how he played. Nobody played. Nobody sounded like Warren Marsh. Uh, as as far out as it may seem, he, he sometimes he sounded like uh, the tape was running backwards. Um, but. Uh, it was just uh, uh, the technique he had uh, for creating uh, uh, improvisation and uh, the tools that he honed uh, f for many years with uh, working with Lenny Tristano. And I mean, I tried, you know, f for you guys in class, um, I mean, it's a little far, far reaching to even mention some of that stuff because it's 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 the rocket science of of improvisation um he he could do 
four different things at the same time. I mean, uh, talk about, uh, you know, the power of what you can do when you put your brain to it. I mean, he could play uh, har in harmonic. Uh, he could uh, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, play in, in, in invert his ideas this way, that way. Uh, he could play in a, a different time signature against four. I mean, that's what's, maybe that's why it sounded like the tape was running backwards, because here's four, two, and he's going, you know, and, and, and so there's three or four things going on at the same time. And the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing is to be able to know exactly where you are and the beat's going like this, and I and, and I heard him do it uh, while we were recording, and uh, 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 I have this this in, in a in a, I I don't know where I, maybe I buried it in the backyard because uh, it, it was dangerous. <laughs> I looked at it. He gave it to me. He says, "Look, we were doing our album together. I mean, we did several albums together, but." Uh, uh, he um, he said to me. I I asked him how he did that. You know, just, how did you do that? You know, and it was the most amazing thing. I you know, and it it just dropped in where it was supposed to. And and he said, well, I I, I, I it's a little bit. Uh, uh, he says, I, I, I wish you wouldn't uh, get interested in all this right now because we're trying to make an album. And if, the minute you start in on this thing, you will have to start over your whole musical thing. We'll, you won't be able to play for a long time, <laughs> is what he, what he told me. And I know what he said because he, 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 the first paragraph on this written, he wrote it out on a, a, a music paper. And it's, instead of notes, there's, there's words, you know. All right, and a set a metronome. This is called, uh, you know, dispersed, dispersal of, you know, um, time against time, time against time against time, and how to approach it. Uh, it's kind of like with a slide rule because uh, you start with the metronome, pick up. Pick a tempo. Make it easy. Tick, 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 tick. Now I want four bars. Make up a a, a, a lick for four bars. Tick, 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 tick. Ba la la ba do ba di 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 da 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 do do di di do da di do da. Tick, 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 tick do 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 di do da da do do di da do 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 di do do di da. Tick, tick, tick. Tick. Now here it comes. Now, metronome. Tick, tick, tick. Start that lick. A quarter of a beat later. Dun, dun, da, 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 da. But the, here's, here's, here's one back here, and you're in here, and then, you know, and then keep increasing the distance, the, you know, and and you're playing that lick, and it's going to end up. In the next four bars somewhere. Yes. So now, I mean, until you 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 can offset a whole chorus and still know where you are. My first attempt, I got so lost I had to borrow money to call home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now I know what he's talking about, you know. I mean, if because I always uh, listen to people, and um, like here I am playing the violin, and because I lived in a, in a, a classical environment with some of the most dynamic, most uh, important. 
musical contributors to the fine art of e every instrument, oboe, flute, greatest flute players, greatest oboe players, greatest violin players, greatest cello players, or greatest French horn players, or because Stravinsky was in our house every day. My dad convinced him to come to L.A. and he put all these beautiful woodwind and orchestral combinations of his music together for him and got the best guys in town. And uh, so he was always there at, at our house, you know. And I was just some of the little kid, you know. And I, yeah, well, what, what's going on, you know? It's, Where's one? <laughs> like I knew, you know. So, um, uh, they went someplace, and they left these records laying on the old record player. And one of them was a Jerry Mulligan record. Jerry Mulligan, Chet Baker, and uh, and um, Carson Smith, who I ended up playing with. It's it's amazing. Uh, to end up playing with a, a, a practically all the people you listen to on a record, you've somewhere in life run into them and you play with them. Larry Bunker. Larry Bunker became a, a crack uh, percussionist in, in the studios and never missed a day of work for 30 years, you know, playing percussion and, 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 and vibes, because he became a, 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 a tour de force on vibes on many uh, records, uh, vocal records or whatever, you know, so. Um, but, and Carson Smith I met at jazz parties. And his brother, Putter Smith, would played with my group at home all, all the time. So there was a family of bass players, you know, so I ran into these people. Anyway, I run into, I get a call, you know, here it is. No, I mean, I, I went to, you know, high school, what you do, you play in the high school band, you know. I, I, I wanted to play and I played mostly by ear because I listened to these people and I, and, and, and I tried to emulate them and I tried to, you know, I mean, that's what I t tell people, you know. You, you listen to people, you know, listen how they do this. I mean, we're, we start with two to five to one, right? Everybody's got to start from two to five to one. Forget modal stuff and, and free jazz. Jazz has been free for a long time around here, hasn't it? <laughs> so free it didn't show up. Um, and so... Uh, then became uh, uh, the high school band and reading and being part of a section and and but my but the reason they asked me to play in this band I got recruited from one high school to another you know it's like football you know you got a guy on your team that's really good next thing you know somebody offers him a big bonus to play for them and then and he's gone you know well, that was ha that's what happened to me because the first high school they didn't have a, a, a they had um, an orchestra and a choir and the music teacher was an oboe player who hated jazz. Just the place you want to be, right? God, perfect, you know. Um, and so uh, I was playing in 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 bands in the summer, you know, when somebody invites you to play in a band, you know, and, and this teacher was there, and he, he was the teacher of the Venice High School band, and, and they had a, a jazz band, and he was one of the first guys that actually sat down and wrote charts for the band. They didn't buy the, the stocks, you know, uh, which were, you know, more or less corny compared to, you know, handwritten really jazz charts, you know. And so from there, 
uh, we went in, into uh, playing in, you know, high school band contests and things like that. Remember they had a, you know, and I've adjudicated on so many of them over the years, you know, it's just, that was a mainstay for income for us, you know. If you had some kind of a reputation, you could go out and, and get, in those days, a couple of grand, but you had, you know, you had to put in the time and you had to get up and talk to the kids and, anyway, um, uh, when I got out of, of uh, high school, I went to the first college band, and the teacher was, his name was Bob McDonald, and he, uh, uh, he had the best band in Los Angeles for a, a, a college, junior college band. Uh, all the guys that made it big in in the jazz community, and, and you know people like Bob Florence, who, who and, and and Mike Barone, who made a living off of Doc Severance and writing charts, faster, high. Uh, higher, louder charts f for the Tonight Show band. They, they turned into lip. They turned into a whip with tassels on them. As Doc, you said, "Come on, you guys. You know, we're going to get serious here." You know. Um. So, uh, when I got out of there, uh, I was I was, I was subbing for my teacher Bob Cooper at the Lighthouse. It was a. a Kind of a, a sit-in lighthouse all-star, you know, and, and and there was another, you know, God, how many great players came out of the lighthouse that that, that made it, like uh, Shorty Rogers and Bud, Bud Shank, who became one of my best ever friends, and we traveled was together. was Ray Brown there at the time as well, or no, it was Howard Rumsey because he owned the joint, uh, and. Um, so out of the blue, I get a call to work with uh, with Chet Baker. Somebody put in a word for me. So uh, this was interesting. You know, it was a little little club on uh, Century Boulevard, which goes all the way to the airport, and it's down in the middle of nowhere, downtown or down in uh, L.A. And uh, and I show up, and guess who's there? Um, uh, it's, uh, Terry Trotter was on, on piano and, and Ray Brown was on bass and um, uh, I'll think of the drummer's name but he was, he was unbelievable um, I should know it <laughs> get, when you get old things disappear uh, but um, uh, we played and it was fun playing with Chet. Uh, I had, her, you know, I had those records and listening to him play. Uh, uh, remember, I said, you know, he could play. He, 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 the way he created music, he was the most lyrical guy, and it was not unusual for him to, to actually play a, a whole chorus in one breath. You know, and the whole the thing is all one chorus. All linked together, you know. Of course, uh, you, you're putting air through a hole this big. And when you got a saxophone, you, you got to really, really be something to carry one that far when you're blowing through a storm drain. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you. Um, so uh, did I? Did I actually answer any questions here? No, no. This is all good stuff. Um, I wanted to I'm dig lost, in. No, 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 you're doing wonderful. This is beautiful stuff. Um, I wanted to dig in a little deeper on some of the things that we covered in the last interview. And while we're here talking about Chet, I'm just curious because, I mean, he was such a, uh, uh, he is such an influence on so many people and so accessible in many, many ways um, with his playing and personality. I know that was a whole other story and, and his, oh uh, his taste it in sure uh, recreational activities. But, um, uh -huh. What what was it like? How was he in terms of like a band leader? Did you just like show up and you knew his albums and called tunes? Was I, there I talk about music? With him. I think it was it was um, 
We were in Colorado. Uh, this is where the, the ugly appeared, the big ugly. In other words, uh, I, I, I have a tune in mind. It's called, you're, no, you're nobody until Chet Baker owes you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because he left us flat after a couple of weeks in, in Pueblo, Colorado. Grabbed the money across the bar and split. And, <laughs> you know, Dave McKay was the piano player and Ch Chuck DeMonico was, was the bass player and a guy named Harry Kivas who was actually a captain in the United States Air Force who worked in the Strategic Air Command Tunnel in Colorado. And when he was out of the tunnel, he'd go out and play gigs and he sounded just like Philly Joe Jones. Unbelievable. I said, where did this guy come from? Smoking, you know. And uh, uh, so he kept the tape running all the time. He had one of those because he traveled all over the world with the Air Force uh, uh, thing, and he, he got this German, you know, you probably, it's, it's a famous recorder with a, the mic, it's a bi-directional mic, uh, multi, you know, and he kept this thing running all the time, and I, I, I'm trying to find these tapes because I, I found remnants of them, but there was a lot of beautiful things that happened between us. I mean, um, psychologically, it took me uh, to, to, to even talk about it because being stranded in, in, in you know, it's like um, call home mom and dad and say, well, um, career's not going too, too, too good. I, I need some money to get home, you know. And um, so to be able to talk about it and be able to realize what really happened there, you know. Uh, and um, I ran into him much later, you know. And Did he have any remorse for the situation or no? Not one iota of remorse. I mean, it was just day-to-day -day business with him. Loan him a horn, it's in a hawk shop the next day, you know. Well, aside from all of the ugly part of that, <laughs> aside from all that, because well, we can, there's, there's books dedicated right, to that. Rule one is <laughs> don't go on a road with a junkie unless you get the money in front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, all I'm going to say. I'm curious, it, with him as a band leader and running a band, was there a discussion about music? Was all of that stuff no, off the cuff? Call you just, tunes. And that was it, uh, the arrangements while you wait. The right guys are there. And I mean, there, you, you wouldn't find a better band than th this band that we, it's all on these tapes. I mean, uh, and, and I, I got a kick out of, Dave, Dave McKay has always been blind. And every once in a while, you know, something had happened and, Ch and Chet would turn around and he said, Dave, don't you see what we're trying to do here? And everybody's laughing on the floor, and including Dave, you know. So... You know, just just one of the things I remember, and it was so so long ago. I mean, I was I don't know if I wasn't even 21 yet, maybe I don't know. No. But uh, well, it's, well, I wanted to also ask you about because um, you've you've worked with all these people that we can read about in books, but you've had these personal interactions, and that's kind of the stuff that I want to know because yeah. um, that's interesting to I've me and better, many other people. <laughs> I've had better uh, situations, you know, working with people. Well, I wanted to ask you about, I know Bob Cooper was one of your first teachers. And, oh, he uh, was a, a salt of the earth. He was the most wonderful guy. Uh, he, uh, it was like retrospect. I, I, the only place in, in town, when you're a youngster and a big jazz fan, you know, like we, we, we hang out with our jazz buddies when we're in high school and stuff, and and I remember the first, we were driving around in a car after we had our jam session and we had the radio on and the first time that anybody heard Milestones with Coltrane and Cannonball 
we had an anxiety attack. We had, the door opened and we all fell out on the sidewalk and we were going, what was that, you know? And every, so we, 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 before we played every, every week, we listened to that record a couple of times, you know. It's, still, it's worth listening to. It's funny you mention that because I've, I've done several of these interviews and a lot of people, you know, everyone always talks about like uh, Kind of Blue being like a seminal album, and, oh, and which, was, which was very important. But the more and more musicians I talk to, uh, Milestones is mentioned a lot as something that kind of blew everyone's mind, Mo even more so than Kind of Blue, which I think is wonderful and interesting, and I th wish more people knew about that album. You know, I mean, and the way Miles played, man, it's just uh, poetry, you know. Well, so going back to, to your relationship with Bob. Well, Bob was uh, playing at the Lighthouse with the All Stars. I mean, uh, obviously, the history is that Bob was, was with Kenton, and so was my band leader acquaintance and and uh, a friend for years um, Bill Holman played next to him played tenor in the band you know and they were all Kenton guys you know and, but when he married June Christie who was uh, you know uh, a big star and uh, uh, they lived it turns out that they lived not me not knowing that, but they lived a, one block away f from where my father, where, where I grew up in that house. Um, and that Bob was taking uh, reed making lessons from my father because Bob played the ob oboe. And um, uh, it's, it's wild because uh, if, if you if you realize that uh, Bud Shank was one of the one guys who was responsible for introducing flute into jazz, and Bob Cooper was an oboe into jazz, which which speaking of getting, doesn't really want to go there. Yes, <laughs> but speaking of getting older, forgetting, I think there's I think there's um, you can find recordings of an album they did oh, yeah. on oboe on YouTube. I, I'm pretty oh, yeah, sure I heard I know it on it is. That. Yeah, definitely. It was. It was eclectic and different, you know. So, but Bob, uh, I walked, I, I didn't know, all this didn't happen until I went to the lighthouse, like with all my friends, we'd go to the lighthouse because they served food there and, and it was okay for minors to be in the audience as long as you didn't try and buy booze. And you, you, you could, and I don't never had, I never had the food there. I don't know. It was, a, it might have been Chinese food or something. But, um, but I, I walked up to him and I, did, you know, I, 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 I said, you know, I want to. My name's so and so, and I want, I want to study with you. Can I? He said, sure. You know, so uh, I found out that he was. We went over to his house and we played and. And uh, uh, I had my my thing going, you know, like all these other people coming out of me, but there might be a spark of something that's actually me there. But he was a big influence. I, I always felt that he was so smooth and, and fluent and, and he could bend. He, he could get, he would get with it when the tempo was up there too. Well, you guys did an album together. Yeah, you guys right play like in, Shauna in Port, for... Portland. Yeah, and you got some really up tempo things on that as well. Sure enough, yeah. it went by like a rocket, you know. Uh, I listened to that now, and I said, "What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Where were I, you I when I needed you?" A, 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 every musician in this day and age <laughs> feels that exact same way, so don't feel bad. Like yeah. I was telling my wife earlier, it's like your worst day is better than most people's <laughs> best day in their entire lives. So that you have no shame. Um, well, I'm curious. So you, know, you know, Coop, um, you hear him. Uh, he he did. Um, I, I keep XM radio going in the car, and I keep the jazz thing going all the time. And I, uh, one of the channels that I really like, uh, uh, this may sound 
you know, uh, a little weird, but I, I, I like the, 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 the Frank Sinatra, you know, channel because uh, they, they'll play all the other singers and I, every once in a while, I actually hear myself playing on one of those, you know. And uh, I go, hey, it's me. And people say, something wrong with that guy, you know. It's because uh, uh, I did, uh, I worked with just about everybody, at least twice. Yeah. Carmen, I, I did an album with Carmen. I met Carmen. Uh, she was wonderful. Uh, the reason I met her because it's it's just this is how life is, you know. If you don't go, and like I tell the kids in school, well, how do you get, you know, how do you how do you go do what you do? How does it start? And I said, well, first of all, you get in, you know, people have bands. Guys are always putting bands together. Get in a band, start playing, learn how to read, take your licks, and people. You see, if people don't hear you or know you exist, then how are you going to get a job unless you make yourself available to all of this? Okay? Some guys are really expert at it. They, it's called working the room, you know. They work the, the, the system, you know. And more power to them, you know. The, the, the more you put, put forward, the more things are going to happen. And... Um, uh, so, uh, uh, after, after I, I, I was sitting in, one of the greatest jazz pianists of all time and one of the, the most interesting characters that you would ever, ever want to uh, uh, hang out with. And, and Li Liberace? No, <laughs> Jimmy Rolls. Jimmy Rolls was one of the greatest... Accompanists. I mean, people like Carmen and people like Sarah Vaughan, that's the first choice because being a great accompanist is an, of, of an art form all of its own. It's funny you say that because there's so many great vocalists, but when you strip it down, a lot of the credit has to go to the musical directors because a lot of those arrangements are what oh. make those songs what they are. You know, well, the singers one are great. Of the I listen to that. Exactly, the singers that, are wonderful, but because the, the charts are unbelievable. Yes. You know, I've written a few things besides bad checks, but to, to take it to that level, you know, uh, I wrote one big band chart for the tonight show that they played and this is i didn't i talk about this in class at port townsend you said many things well over the course of our friendship yeah. <laughs> well i have to take a few of them back but <laughs> blah, 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 blah. but um learning how to write makes you a better musician all oh, oh boy it, it gives you a, a better understanding of of, of harmony and uh, especially when you were, the proof of the pudding would be, be Jerry Mulligan and, and Bob Brookmar. When they played together and they worked off of each other, just like I did, you know, uh, we, we're talking about me and Warren and how that worked. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that because I think that was the first question and yeah. how, we got in, how we got to Bermuda, I will never know, but <laughs> it's a little warm here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you, 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 if you listen to the Mulligan Band and you listen to all the great music that Bob Brookmeyer wrote and all the great music that, that, that Jerry Mulligan wrote and everything, it, it's a natural that, that, that they could play together and make incredibly, uh, uh, uh harmonious uh, presentations every night working off of each other and playing yeah. in harmony made up on the spot. I'm actually reading, I'm in the middle of reading a book about Jerry Mulligan right now and there was t they're talking about that format of the band. But there's also one, I guess, with Art Farmer included as well. Oh, Art was so smooth. I loved Art Farmer. I liked that group with, uh, you know, Benny Golson. Boy, that was hot, right? Killer Joe. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, um, going back, you mentioned, I want to go back a little bit. Um, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, with, with your association with Warren Marsh, and I believe the first time I read this, this was in the liner notes to one of these albums, The Conversations with Warren on the CD, but you talk about this rhythmic displacement. That's where I first heard about this idea and yeah. learned it from you was via the liner notes. But uh, going back to your association with Bob, I mean, you already knew how to kind of play before you met him. Yeah. Do you, are there any concepts that you can remember back that were very helpful you know, that you got from Bob? Or? Well, I try to talk about things, but he'd just look at me and he'd say, why don't we just play? <laughs> It'll all come come to you when when, when we we play, you know. We, we talk about it all day long, but why don't we play, you know? And we did, and I and and um, like I was trying to say, he was Bob was was actually Lester Young reincarnated with a a bonfire under him, you know. Yeah. It's the one thing that Lester was was great, but he didn't have the fire that some of the other tenor players had. Did you ever encounter uh, any run-ins with Lester Young or no? No, I'm too young. I'm 76, I'm saying I was, I'm too young. <laughs> I, tell me, too, I was too young, he was gone before I ever even picked up a horn, you know. What about, uh, I'm curious, uh, what about Sonny Stitt? I know he was always one to interchange with saxophone battles. He was one. Boy, was he a character. And uh, you talk about combatants. <laughs> combatants, because, you know, there, there were some serious combatants going on all the time. Sonny Stitt and Sonny Rollins, they went at it. Like, it was a street fight every time, you know. And, uh, and, and then Gene Ammons got into the fray, you know. And uh, uh, all these people, were influences on me because there was there was just something precious about what they were doing. Sonny had had lightning technique, you know, and and he didn't do too bad in the harm, harmonic thing either, you know. I mean, he got all over it, and uh, um, but Sonny Rollins, when he came along, it was so raw. And so earthy, kind of. That's the only way I could explain it, because the way he played on the Bridge album, you know, when I heard that, it took a minute, because everybody else was so, so refined, you know, and had their sound together, and, his, and, 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 and Sonny came at you like a chainsaw, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but... After a while, you step back and you see the whole painting, and it's beautiful, you know, it's raw, and it's just beautiful, you know, and accomplished. I hear him talking now, and I, I can't believe it, you know, he's, I don't think he's playing anymore, but uh, uh, he lost a mouthpiece or somebody stole it. That's common, get your mouthpiece stolen. You leave your horn on the stand and somebody, psh, bam, mm, out. If I, I almost lost a whole horn and mouthpiece when I was working with Chet Baker. That time I worked with Chet. It was, we were only there for like a few days or something, but I left my horn in the back room and then I, I, I just had to, I went back to get my horn and there was a guy standing in the doorway of the, parking lot with my horn behind like this. He was looking like this. He was going to split with it. I ran up and I grabbed it out of his hand and I went like this. I was going to hit him with it and psh, he took off. And I, every day I think about that. I go, it was that close. Because yeah. I, I read that mouthpiece yeah. for ever. You know, it's, it's, I'm still, it's, it's, it's still here. I mean, uh, you know, I, I let this guy copy it. Um, his name is Aaron Drake and he's a, a wonderful guy. And, uh, 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 it took a few times of, of, of redo and redo and redo because mouthpieces of, 
is an art form all of its own. Well, for, for people that don't understand what you're talking about, as a saxophone player, you know, there's kind of like a, a neurosis where you kind of go with, you're always trying to find a better mouthpiece. Like I myself have two shoe boxes at home full of very expensive yeah, mouthpieces. Too. You, on the other hand, have had well, the same mouthpiece your entire life, which is a, a I couldn't feat. come up with anything better because it was like, uh, you know, you remember when we were kids and we, we were in school and we said, what would you like? Uh, I, I, I was in the beginning class, you know, to, what do you want to play? I said, uh, I want to play. A, I want to play a saxophone. And uh, I, I was a violin player in the orchestra, and I went into the beginning winds class. And I didn't tell my folks, because that would have pissed them off. Because I was supposed to be Yasha Heifetz, <laughs> and to this day, nobody's Yasha Heifetz. So I think I made the right move there. But. Um, uh, his name was. Uh, um, what was his name? Armor. Yeah. Uh, he uh, he was a saxophone player, and uh, he, he I said I want to play the saxophone, and he was a tenor player, so he picked me out a tenor. I mean, I was listening to Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan. I didn't realize it was a baritone. It was a saxophone. You know, and now I've been, I, I was on the hunt for an old con like that for years. I, I have, I am baritone poor. I have more baritones than I could possibly, and they all stink. Didn't, I can't remember, <laughs> didn't you or Rams actually acquire one of Jerry Mulligan's old baritone saxophones? No, no, but uh, Rams's horn is, 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 lo and behold, it was one of the best ever cons because it's the 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 keys are in the right place the old cons the keys are sp spread out like that yeah. so you have to clean and jerk a buick to get a low b and go from d flat to b is impossible yeah. you know yeah. it'll put you in the hospital so um you know i mean uh so so aaron drake you have aaron, you, well, you've been playing on a, that mouth we what happened was I, uh, he sent it back and I played it and I sent it back and I played it against mine and it's, I, I was with a, a wonderful uh, best friend of mine who, who uh, plays great and he wrote a, he just wrote this book on uh, the Altissimo. I, I encouraged him to because nobody does it. He played with Tower of Power and, I, and everybody who plays with Tower of Power He's got to play in the f fourth octave all the time, you know. And that's a science all of its own, you know. Um, and so uh, we sent the mouthpiece that they sent back to me to a friend of his in, in, in uh, New Jersey or New York. I think they called themselves the mouthpiece guys. And he looked at it, and, and, and he had my dimensions. Dimensions, with, it's like, dimensions, what they put on on the, on, the, on the mouthpiece. You know, like, mine says 130 SMS over zero. So the chamber is a, a, a zero chamber or something like that, and the, and, and the, the, the 130 is the opening between the reed and the mouthpiece. So we measure, when you really measure it, you put a reed on there and measure it. Mine is actually 122, 124, it's not 130. Yeah. But the secret, there's, there's a little phantasma kind of secret formula that, uh, you know, that only the people who've made a thousand million mouthpieces know because everything can be bought or lost with one swipe in the wrong direction on that mouthpiece. It's that exacting and only the mouthpieces. And Berg was from England, Berg was English. And the mouthpiece that I have is 
is all got all his file marks on it. Uh, the table is, if you look at the mouthpiece flat, it, it, it's a little bit cockeyed like that. But it was one of those things that he probably did that because he played it and he said it needs to be something needs to to give way so to let this thing. And he, he did that and bam, it played. You know. Well, it's like the older ones were all hand finished; they were done by hand, and now a lot of the newer ones are fabricated by a machine, milled out by a machine, and and computer. Oh, I'm uh, convinced dimensions. that they have no idea what to do. Yeah. They, the, 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 there isn't one iota of the original. M m uh, character or mouthpiece uh, of the mouthpiece that was the Berg Larson in in the in the forties. I'm glad we're having this conversation because my wife's in the front row, so this will justify spending a thousand dollars on a mouthpiece now. Oh right? yeah. Well, if luckily you, you get to play it, at, at least play it uh, uh, enough to find out that I wouldn't give a thousand dollars for this mouthpiece because I'm never going to like it. You know, but that's why the older ones. I mean, what, what people don't understand, like the older instruments were built better. They were made better with more care and craftsmanship, and that's why the prices are more astronomical. Oh, yeah, yeah. My first horn. What was your first horn? Uh, my first horn was uh, had a Selmer Bundy two, and I had an alto and a tenor, which were great because they were Selmer horns. And yeah. a lot of the newer horns now. When I talk to repairmen, they're like, they they are the the metal. That they won't take a balance, so they'll get the horns adjusted, as you know, and then with students not really knowing what to do, they're kind of hard on the instruments, and they will lose, they will get out of alignment much more easily than older horns would, like Yamahas or Selmers. Uh-huh. Uh, my experience was that the older Selmers, you know, like the one I have, I played for many, many years. Uh, right now I'm playing a, a late model six and it's it wasn't made out of the brass that the early sixes were made of because the brass came from artillery shells there was a billion artillery shells laying around and stockpiled up stockpiled brass and and in the best quality brass i mean it was it was the real thing, you know, when they when they knew how to make things, I don't know. Is that's the only thing I could I could uh, equate to it. But um, that brass ran out in the in somewhere in the in the late fifties, early sixties. And um, my balance that I played, you know, the silver horn that I played on, uh, and that it has this sound to it that I. I I fell in love with it, and I, I, I was lucky to get it. Um, uh, it was a, you know, a, a late balance. So it was there was virtually the only difference between that and a Mark VI is a black plastic thumb button, and a and a and an S on the octave key, yeah. Superman or something. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, but it, it it was silver plated, and silver is uh, uh, the sound just pew, it it comes out of there bright, really bright. I had a horn, you know, and and I, I had this fascination with gold horns, and everybody had a gold horn, you know, and they're beautiful, but they're a pain in the ass, because I find that's uh, I found this out the hard way, uh, you know. I mean, I was. I had bought this horn. Um, finally, uh, uh, my first horn was a con, and many, many, many people played con. A lot of many, many people still play a con, you know, and it got me going a 10 m con, you know. But the thing about the Selmers were were the modern, uh, uh, the lower keys. This, this, the mechanism, it's so easy to go from B to D flat to, to B flat to, to A flat and all that because the way it, it floats around, it's right where your finger needs to be all the time, whereas the other one was just, you know, like a stirrup on a horse, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
it, and, and it's a percentage of if you, you're going to get where you want to go, you know. But unless you you spend a lot of time, you know. And so uh, this horn uh, was was made out of that that material and. When I had the, this horn I have now redone, uh, I found it. I, I, I don't pay. I didn't pay very much for it. My, my one of my great friends, uh, Rusty Higgins, and sax, great saxophone player, has a woodwind shop and teaches kids in Long Beach. I had the horn. He called me. and said, "I got this horn in here. You're gonna see it." You know. And I went down there. And so I went and I played it, and I said. Shh. I paid four grand for it. I mean, it's a, a Selmer now, you know, any Selmer, you know, you can pay nine thousand dollars for I've, it. I've seen like twelve for a mint condition, like super balanced action. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I had it redone, and, and the, the guy who did it was uh, Ivan Lucatus. Ivan. Ivan Jesus. You be careful with this one. It's very soft. He says, if you pick it up wrong, you could bend it. I tell you, don't pick it up by the neck. Always do this and do that because it's very soft. I mean, it's soft enough. It's like if you play a wrong note in a chord, it goes out of adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a, the learning horn on everybody's thing, a horn that'll go, go completely dead if you play the wrong note. <laughs> Getting back at you, you know. <laughs> well, before we run out of time here, I mean, we're, we, I Did we get any? No, I could, I could barrage <laughs> you with questions all day long. Well, um, was a, there was something in there that was really important. Oh, that's, that's, uh, we'll have to do another one. Um, are there any questions online thus far? No, any questions from our in-person audience? Yes. So the question for those listening is, did you ever enter in a pro into a project or a recording or something that you didn't want to do, but after it was completed and done that you were happy about the results and that you actually did it? I Honestly, I, I can't. Um, You're not going to say this interview, are you? No, but <laughs> I'm saying a project. Um, um, if I put a project together, it was because... Uh, uh, like we had an album, we had this music, and, and we had this music written so that we had something nice and new to play. And uh, 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 so eventually we decided we were going to record it. And so um, we worked very hard to make it make it happen, you know, and, and there's... The, the modern techniques in uh, recording and everything, it, it, it enables you to work with the product and make it better. But as far as projects like you're talking about, where um, um, I didn't, wasn't afforded the luxury of having a, 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 a project like that when I was working all the time. It was, it was a phone call and it was an album or, or be there and you will find out when you get there what it is and sometimes it's it's like okay you're recording tonight with Tony Bennett and a full orchestra or or you're doing something um, and and believe me and, and when you worked as many years as I did in, in Los Angeles uh, more often it was some of some kind of a, a rock and roll kind of thing um, th I was involved in Steely Dan's project. They called me out of the blue. And you know how big they are. I mean, they were, you know. I tell you, I never knew them. I didn't know of them, you know. And I go there. After the Tonight Show, I had a gig. The Tonight Show was great. You'd be there at 3 in the afternoon, 
and you do rehearsals and you come back and, 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 and at 5 you go on the air or 5.30 and then by 6.30 the show is over and now you go someplace else. And I had this gig tonight at uh, 7, 7.30, whenever you can get there. We got a solo on a record we want you to do. And I don't even think they said that. They just uh, be at this village recorders, which I met, met many, many different recordings at that, that place. And I walk in, and there's these two guys. And I had no idea, you know, this was one or two or three albums down the road from the, the, the biggest albums that, that were playing on the radio all the time, and you still hear them all the time, you know. And, and uh, this was a new project, and, and uh, 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 so, um, they play the tune f for me, and I have no, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, uh, people ask you to do a solo. Sometimes it's something that you immediately can just sink your teeth into and make it happen, and sometimes you wish you had just said no because there's nothing you can do uh, that's going to please you or them, you know. And, uh, but this was a tune, you know, and it, it was, they played the tune and it was, uh, it was called Deacon Blue. And Deacon Blue was a, a, a fella, you know, learned to work a saxophone, play what I feel, get, drink scotch whiskey all night long and die behind the wheel. And, uh, I listened, I listened to that lyric and I, I said, they're talking about me. This is me. Wait a minute. Is that why they called me? <laughs> well, I went in there and, I, and Tom Scott wrote this beautiful arrangement. Tom is a genius, you know, always been a genius and, and plays so great, you know. We've, we haven't seen each other in a long time, but I, I, I miss being around them. But, because um, we were kids coming up together too. And uh, his father was a, 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 an arranger. That's where he got. Learning how to really seriously arrange and write music. Well, Tom, he, man, he can do it, you know. So he did this and uh, I played this thing and I played um, one chorus on it. Played the, played the whole thing in one chorus. And it just laid right there, you know. And they just, I hear the, the booth, the mic goes to the booth. All right, that's great. Come on in. You know, I listened to it. They said, you're done. And I, I thought, well, yeah, I thought I did okay. But honest to God, people tell me that uh, they, they had ten people do the same solo. I must have been number 10 or something, you know, and they, they like this one, you know, or they made you do it 30 times, you know. Uh, there's something, a project, like, like, if you're doing a project with somebody and they, like it's an orchestra or something and you've got a solo and, uh, they play it, and you play your song. It's, it's more often than not, when you're working off the hip and off the top of your head and taking advantage of the moment, I mean, especially if there's a symphony orchestra there, and it's so important, you know. They say, you better not mess up, man. This, this better be good, you know. So you're laying into this thing, and you're trying to, you know, say, I'm not going to fall off this horse. We're going to go all the way. And... Um, they said, that's great. Now let's, let's make another one. And you just thought you just made your best one. And then they keep playing it over and over. And pretty soon you're getting to hate this tune and you never want to play it again. You never even want to hear it, you know. Uh, um, working with people that do that, uh, it takes a while to get over the fact that you, you just 
no matter what happens, you need the money, but you don't want to go through this. So you just say, no, uh, I have a banjo lesson. I can't be there. Very good. Or I, I'm unavailable. I'm unavailable. <laughs> um, are, are there any other questions from the in-studio audience or the, the online audience? No. One more question. Yes. Yeah. So the question is in well, regards to recording if you have... It can be done both ways, yeah. and if it's done well, and if it's put together and, and with... Uh, uh, because I did so many years in, 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 uh, in, that, in that situation where it was either going to be this way. Uh, we're the horn section, we're going to go in and do... And the, the tracks are already on. And, and, and it's working with a multi-track machine. Um, all these tracks for, for us, when we go in there, are open. And the other tracks on there are already there. And the rhythm section is there. And so we're just playing to it. So if there's some kind of problem, we just go back and fix it. And then it's a finished product. And then whatever less, whatever more they're going to do on there, uh, usually the horns are the last thing. And uh, the other, the other thing is my father's world, the symphony world, the the, the symphony orchestra quality players working in a motion picture studio, and a hundred people are there. And the film is going on here. The, or the conductor is watching the film, and you're the you're in the orchestra, and you're watching me, and you're reading this music for the first time. And usually they run it down once, and then they make it they make a take. That's what it take. And so uh, that's the situation, and everybody's put it playing at the same time and the whole thing goes on the tape just the way it is. Um, some people have, have a, a, a small studio. One of the, this album that's going to come out uh, that I finished oh, last, maybe a couple of years ago, I, I think it was maybe more, but uh, I went down to LA and I played it up this guy's studio, it's, 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 it's smaller than this stage. And he had a piano, and he had a set of drums, and five feet away, it, a, a folding chair and the recording equipment, you know. And it's all digital stuff, so, and on a computer and everything, so there's so many things you can do with that. And, uh, uh, but this, what it was that he recorded the rhythm section first. And he asked me who I wanted to play, and I, I got the guys I wanted, the guys I worked with in LA that I think consider the guys I would want to record with. And, and so it was Joe LaBarbera and uh, Tom Rainier and uh, um, uh, oh, I remember, but. Uh, They individually went in. I mean, I've never seen this before. The piano player goes in f f first, uh, and uh, and then um, uh, then the bass player, because they couldn't get separation in this. You, you need separation to, to to record, so one mic isn't bleeding into the other, so you can't mix it. So there's got to be separation in the recording when you're recording like that. So everybody went in individually and did their parts. So it was put together like a, you know, like an old car or something, you know. Well, this piece is done, this goes on, this goes on, this goes on, you know. 
And then I show up, and uh, I do my part. And then a trumpet player friend of mine, I asked, and he came in and he did his part. So the whole thing was done in little pieces. When they finally put it together, it's, it took a little work, you know, uh, mixing. Uh, that was the emphasis on mixing was the most important thing about that whole project. Mixing all these different uh, performances that were done at different times. Uh, even in the same studio, you know. So uh, that's what I know about it anyway. And, uh, it's, it's different than like, you know, all the magic that was produced with uh, Alfred Lyon and all the Blue Note things where it's one guy, or one guy, the engineer, and, and one mic, and there, or a couple mics in a room, and they do it all within one or two takes. It, a different, different yeah, way of doing what it. What amazes me is that all those Blue Notes albums, they have the same piano, and it's out of tune. <laughs> That's where we're going to leave this interview for today because we're out of time. Uh, Pete, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure, and we could spend hours more just, uh, just barraging with questions. But thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Uh, and uh, thank you to our, our audience, <laughs> a small but powerful audience, and our viewers online. Um, we're going to take a short break here, and uh, then we're going to get things uh, sound checked for the concert, which is going to begin at 3 o'clock. Um, if you find value in these interviews and you want to support the work that we're doing here and you'd like to make a donation, you can do that online via Venmo or PayPal or mailing a check um, but we'd appreciate it, it helps keep supporting uh, the work that we're doing uh, and uh, we'll be right back with some music for you thank you so much <laughs>